Crime and Crime Again is a true crime podcast containing subject matter that may be graphic or disturbing. Listener discretion is advised. Most people do not understand me. There are people willing to be my friends, but mostly, they're either too ignorant to understand why I am like I am, and consequently offer my mind no challenge, or they haven't the wits to match mine. Betty Williams, 1960 In 1960, Odessa, Texas had blossomed into a booming oil town. Between 1950 and 1960, the population of the small Midwestern town had skyrocketed from 29,000 to over 80,000. The oil industry has remained the center of Odessa's economy since the 1920s. You may also recognize Odessa, Texas, as the setting for the 2004 film Friday Night Lights. The movie follows the lives of Permian High School's football team, a real high school in Odessa. But today's case will take us through the halls of another small town school, Odessa High School. Odessa High School's auditorium is said to be the haunt of a particularly well-known ghost in town. Stage lights moving on their own, a shadowy figure watching theater rehearsals from the balcony, and mysterious lipstick marks on boys' arms. The high school's alumni over the last six decades have seemingly all shared the same belief about the ghost, and passed the legends down from generation to generation. Elizabeth Jean Williams, known to everyone as Betty, was born on August 11, 1943, in Marion, Illinois. When Betty was 12 years old, her family moved from Illinois to Odessa, Texas. Her father was a carpenter, and her mother worked at a department store. Both of her parents maintained a strict Christian household. Betty was the eldest of four children. She had two sisters and a brother. In the fall of 1960, Betty was a 17-year-old senior at Odessa High School. At the time, Odessa was a deeply conservative, devoutly Christian town that Betty had never quite fit into. She was fiercely opinionated, and seemed to thrive on the reactions that her contrarian ideals would inspire in her peers. Betty was openly anti-segregation and pro-sexual freedom, both of which made her a social outcast in the eyes of most of her classmates. Even at just 17, Betty thought the taboo surrounding sex was absurd and restrictive and she did not subscribe to the conservative beliefs of most of the other girls her age. Betty was outspoken and flirtatious, and she often found herself in the crosshairs of jealous girlfriends. Allegedly, Betty was not shy about making advances toward boys at school who already had what teenagers in the 1960s would call steady girlfriends. Because her bedroom had a back door leading to the outside— It wasn't difficult for Betty to find frequent opportunities to sneak out after curfew and walk the few blocks to the local diner, Tommy's Drive-In. It was at this favorite teenage hangout that Betty would mingle with the popular boys at school, i.e. the football players, and catch the side-eyes of the girls who had accompanied them. A passionate theater student, Betty had secured lead roles in many of the school's productions, three of which she landed all during her sophomore year. Betty dreamt of someday performing under the lights of a Broadway stage, and maybe even making it to Hollywood. She and her best friend Gail had already decided that they wanted to attend Indiana University together to study theater. During her junior year of high school, Betty had struck up a friendship with a boy named Mac Herring, a football player at Odessa High School who was one year below Betty. Betty and Mac were on entirely opposite ends of the social spectrum. She was raised in a lower-middle-class family, lived in a modest house, and had become an outcast at school. Mac was raised in a more financially stable family and was popular and well-liked. He was quieter, a bit reserved, but was simultaneously the high school stereotype, the boy that girls fawned over when he passed them in the halls or sat next to them in class. By the time the summer of 1960 rolled around, their friendship had become more of a fling, and at least from Betty's perspective, They were officially dating. Betty gushed to her close circle of friends about Mac. She felt like he listened to her, and understood her in a way that no one else ever had. Mac, however, didn't seem to share her sentiments. Betty never met Mac's family or friends, and she was never invited to accompany him to parties or other outings with friends. 
In fact, it seemed that Mac wanted to keep his relationship with Betty secret. By August of 1960, it appeared that Betty felt spurned by Mac's overt discretion and unwillingness to make their relationship official. One night, perhaps to try to make Mac jealous or offer him a taste of how rejected she felt, Betty got into a car and headed off to a secluded spot with Bill Rose, another football player and one of Mac's best friends. Bill Rose himself would later deny that anything had actually happened between him and Betty in the car, but Betty's cousin, Shelton Williams, told a different account of the incident. In 2004, Shelton published a book recounting his upbringing in Odessa and telling the story of Betty Williams from an insider perspective. According to Shelton, Betty called him the night that she met up with Bill Rose, and she told him that she and Bill did indeed have a sexual encounter that night. Whether anything happened in the car with Bill or not, it didn't make Mac jealous. Instead, he simply decided that he didn't want any kind of relationship with Betty at all, and he broke things off with her. I've never been so humiliated and torn to pieces as I am now. I feel so lonely and deserted. I don't care what happens now or ever. This is pure hell. Betty Williams, 1960 The breakup was absolutely devastating for Betty. Her senior year of high school seemed to already be off to a miserable start. Odessa High School had hired a new drama teacher that year, and the new teacher didn't appear to be as impressed with Betty's performances as the former teacher. For the first production of her senior year, Betty was passed over for a role in Winterset, and was instead chosen as the stage manager. The lead roles in the play were given to her best friend Gail, and, much to Betty's dismay, Mac Herring who landed the role of the murderer Trochistrea. Betty was forced to watch from behind the curtains, clipboard in hand, as her best friend and ex-boyfriend commanded the stage. It was also around this time that Betty's home life began to spiral. Betty kept a detailed diary, in which she would describe her encounters with different boys from school. Suspecting that his once devout and obedient Christian daughter was up to some trouble after dark, Betty's father decided one night to search through her room for clues to confirm his suspicions. He found Betty's diary. She was chastised and belittled for the things that her father read in the diary, and despite her attempts to convince him that she was no longer doing any of those things, he tried to tighten the restrictions on her social life. Based on the episode of A Crime to Remember that covered Betty's case, her father may have even forbade her from going away to college after high school. It seemed that instead of college, he wanted her to get a job and stay close to home and out of trouble. While working on the play together, Betty and Max seemed to rekindle a friendship. After all, they would be spending a lot of time in each other's company while the play was in production, so it was natural that they would be amicable. Betty even started helping Mac with stage tips and would practice running his lines with him. But it was during the rehearsals for Winterset that Betty began to make strange and unsettling comments to her friends. She would remark that, quote, heaven must be a nice place, end quote. And soon, her offhanded comments turned into disturbing requests that her friends wrote off as attempts at dark humor. Betty told several of the other students working on the play that she didn't want to be alive anymore, but that she couldn't bring herself to do anything about it. She even claimed that she'd tried to end her life by taking several aspirin. Her dark thoughts brought her to the point of asking her friends if they would be willing to help her, but her friends never took her seriously. They brushed off her morbid comments as jokes, thinking it was another ploy by Betty to be the center of attention. One of her friends said that when she asked him if he would kill her, he joked with her, saying that he would charge a pretty penny for his services. Betty Williams was crying out for help, but no one could hear her. When all of her friends seemed to turn the other cheek to her internal suffering, Betty turned to the one person whose affection and attention she truly wanted. At first, when Betty asked Mac to help her with her problem, he would laugh it off, just like her other friends had. Betty would laugh with him, and they would move on until the next time that Betty asked the question. Some sources say that she pleaded for his help for days or weeks, while others say it only took a couple of attempts to convince Mac that she needed him to take her pain away. We'll never know exactly how many times Mac heard her pleas. On the evening of March 21, 1961, 
Betty arrived home around 10 p.m. after spending a few hours at rehearsals for winter set. She said goodnight to her mother and went to her bedroom to change into her pajamas. The next morning, around 7.45 a.m., Betty's mother was setting the table for breakfast when she noted that Betty hadn't come out of her bedroom yet. When she went to check on her daughter, she found the room empty and her bed made up. Figuring that Betty may have simply left early for school that day, her mother called the school to verify that she was there. But Betty had never arrived at school that morning. No one had seen Betty since she left rehearsals the night before. Police immediately went to Odessa High School to question Betty's friends and classmates about her last known whereabouts. Initially, Betty's friends were hesitant to offer the police too much information about Betty's personal life, fearing that sharing her secrets would get her into trouble with her parents. But soon, Gail and Betty's other friends opened up to police about Betty's evening trysts with boys in parked cars, and it was even revealed that Betty had recently started seeing an older man who worked as a DJ at a local radio station. The man was questioned, but it appeared that police quickly ruled him out as a potential suspect, and they returned their attention to the teenagers who knew Betty best. With some encouragement, a student named Ike Nail revealed to police that he had actually given Betty a ride home from rehearsals the night before. He claimed that he dropped her off at her house around 10 p.m., but police felt that there was more to the story. Ike soon told them that Betty had asked him to come back to her house and pick her up around 10.30 p.m., and that's exactly what he did. Betty walked outside through the back door in her bedroom, wearing baby pink shorty pajamas and a blue and white striped duster. She got into Ike's car, and though it's not verified, it's possible that they did have an encounter while they sat in the parked car. Ike recalled seeing headlights pull up behind them around 11 p.m., and he knew exactly whose car it was. When Betty turned around toward the flash of headlights, she said in disbelief, quote, Oh my God, I didn't think he'd come, end quote. She quickly got out of Ike's car, but not before she turned to him and said, quote, I have to call his bluff, even if it kills me, end quote. Betty Williams got into Mac Herring's car, and they drove off into the night. Police set their sights on Mac Herring. He was there at school that morning, so police sat him down to question him. Mac told police that he did, in fact, pick Betty up at her house around 11 p.m. the night before. He claimed that they drove around and talked for a while, before he dropped her off at home around midnight. When questioned about the details of dropping Betty off, Mac told police that he dropped her off at the front door of her home, but didn't wait to see if she made it inside. This immediately struck police as strange. If Betty had snuck out through the back door of her bedroom, why would she risk the wrath of her parents by coming back in through the front door of the house? Police decided that they needed to bring Mac down to the station to try and gather more information. Within 45 minutes of arriving at the police station, he told the police that he had shot and killed Betty because she had begged him to do it. Bewildered but not entirely convinced, authorities pushed Mac for more details. He told them that her body was in a small stock pond, a few miles northwest of Odessa, in the middle of nowhere. B.R. McAlpine, the head of Odessa's Youth Council Division, Detective Fred Johnson, and Texas Ranger Dudley White asked Mac Herring to show them where exactly Betty was, and the four of them made the drive 26 miles outside of town, following Mac's directions, to a piece of land that Mac's father had leased for his family to go hunting on. When they arrived at the dry, desert expanse of shrubs and open field, Mac walked up a hill to where the stock pond sat. He told authorities that Betty's body was in the middle of the pond. When asked if he could locate her body, Mac didn't hesitate. He stripped down to his underwear and waded into the water. When the water was nearly chest deep, Mac reached under and began to pull something heavy back toward the shore. In his hands were two human feet. Authorities instructed Mac to leave the body on the bank of the pond, and they immediately called for an ambulance. As Betty Williams' body lay at the edge of the water, Mac got dressed and explained the events of the night before to the officers. Soon, the ambulance, more officers, and reporters arrived on the scene. On the ride out to the secluded spot, Mac claimed that Betty kept talking about how happy she was soon going to be, and how excited she was to get to heaven. Betty and Mac arrived at the spot around midnight, and when they got out, Mac pulled the 12-gauge shotgun from his car. He claimed that Betty herself had chosen which shotgun he should use. They stood and talked for about 15 minutes. 
Mac then asked Betty for a kiss to remember him by, and after the kiss, Betty knelt to the ground and Mac raised the gun. She grabbed the barrel, lifted it to her left temple, and Mac pulled the trigger. Betty was nearly decapitated by the point-blank shotgun blast. He weighed her body down with two lead weights and submerged her in the stock pond where he left her. Officers and reporters who were there at the scene have said that Mac Herring was unnervingly stoic and cold when he recounted the murder of his ex-girlfriend. Highway patrolman E.C. Locklear cuffed Mac Herring and put him into the patrol car, asking him, Mac, didn't you expect to get caught? Mac replied, not this quick. Mac also allegedly told another sheriff, quote, I feel toward her like a cat lying in a muddy street in the rain, end quote. Mac Herring's trial began on February 20th, 1962, or rather what was supposed to be a trial. But Mac's defense attorney, Warren Burnett, had other plans. Burnett intended to present a temporary insanity defense to the judge, meaning if he could prove that Mac Herring was temporarily insane, or in other words, insane only during the crime, not before or after, there would be no trial, and Mac Herring would walk free. What was supposed to be the beginning of a murder trial became a hearing to determine whether there would even be a trial. Warren Burnett argued to Judge G.C. Olson that before a trial began, jurors should first be given the opportunity to evaluate the possibility that Mac Herring was temporarily insane at the time he committed the crime. So, if the jurors determined that Mac was temporarily insane, there would be no murder trial. Judge Olson granted Mac Herring a pretrial insanity hearing. The hearing was held in Kermit, Texas, 45 miles away from Odessa. The courtroom quickly began to look like a Mac Herring fan club. Dozens of teenagers filled the room, openly offering their support for Mac. The seats behind the defense team were overflowing but Betty Williams had only her parents on her side. The very first witness called to the stand by the defense was Mac's father, O.H. Herring. When Mac's father took the stand, he told the courtroom that on March 22, 1961, his son, Mac Herring, handed him a letter written by Betty Williams. A letter that might exonerate his son for the murder of his ex-girlfriend. I want everyone to know that what I'm about to do in no way implicates anyone else. I say this to make sure that no blame falls on anyone other than myself. I have depressing problems that concern, for the most part, myself. I'm waging a war within myself, a war to find the true me, and I fear that I am losing the battle. So rather than admit defeat, I'm going to beat a quick retreat into the no-man's land of death. As I have only the will and not the fortitude necessary, a friend of mine, seeing how great is my torment, has graciously consented to look after the details. His name is Mac Herring, and I pray that he will not have to suffer for what he is doing for my sake. I take upon myself all blame, for there it lies on me alone. Betty Williams, March 20th, 1961 This letter was later analyzed, and it was determined to be written by Betty herself. On the day Mac was arrested, his father turned the letter over to police. Nine character witnesses testified for the defense, all praising Mac Herring's athleticism and his quiet, good-natured demeanor. Three people testified that before Betty had turned to Mac, she had asked them to end her life, and they all refused, believing her strange requests to be nothing more than morbid jokes. The key witness for the defense was Dr. Marvin Grice, a psychiatrist who evaluated Mac Herring three days after he murdered Betty Williams. Dr. Grice said, quote, He became so mixed up and so sick that he felt pulling the trigger was what he should do for her. He can be trusted to lead a normal life. It seemed that both the defense team and the entire town of Odessa, Texas, were convinced that Mac Herring had simply been manipulated into holding a shotgun to his ex girlfriend's head and pulling the trigger. Locals openly expressed their beliefs that Betty Williams was a fast girl who had tricked a good boy into hurting her and ruining his life. The odds were stacked against District Attorney Dan Sullivan, who was arguing for the prosecution. Sullivan argued that Mac Herring should be evaluated by a psychiatrist appointed by the prosecution before the trial continued. But Judge Olson denied the motion, citing Defense Attorney Burnett's argument that Mac Herring's current state of mind was irrelevant. 
After all, he had only been insane during the crime. Warren Burnett then called Mac Herring himself to the stand, and immediately passed him to the prosecution to be questioned. Dan Sullivan pushed Mac to offer details about the murder of Betty Williams, but Mac offered no significant testimony. He struggled to gather his thoughts and stammered through his answers, repeatedly claiming that he just didn't know what had happened or why. The jury didn't even hear the indictment read to them. They didn't hear any of the actual facts and evidence of the crime that was committed. The jury deliberated for 11 hours before returning with their verdict. They determined that Mac Herring was temporarily insane when he murdered Betty Williams. He would walk free. But District Attorney Sullivan wasn't quite ready to give up. Sullivan appealed the verdict to the Texas Supreme Court, and on June 27, 1962, the court ordered a new trial for Mac Herring. The second trial was held in Beaumont, Texas, 600 miles away from Odessa. The turnout for the second trial was no different from the first. Mac Herring had the support of seemingly all of small-town Texas. In the eyes of the locals of Odessa, Betty Williams had been deemed a pariah, a devious temptress who felt so aggrieved by the loss of Mac's affections that she set out to destroy him by sacrificing herself. Witness after witness sung Mac's praises. He was described on the stand as brilliant, and one person even said that Mac Herring personified everything that was good. The prosecution had almost nothing to argue with. The biggest question still on everyone's minds was, why? What compelled Betty Williams to ask such a gruesome request? And what compelled Mac Herring to believe that pulling the trigger was the right thing to do? There was no clear answer. The prosecution had still not been able to establish a clear motive. On December 13, 1962, the jury found Mac Herring not guilty of the murder of Betty Williams, by reason of insanity. Tears were shed by many in that courtroom when the verdict was read, but very few of them were for Betty Williams. Mac Herring was so beloved by the town of Odessa that he never truly left. He went on to attend Texas Tech University before returning home to the town that forgave him and turned Betty Williams into an urban legend. He did various work as a carpenter and spent over 25 years as an electrician. He even got married, twice, and also divorced twice. Mac Herring died on January 19, 2019, at the age of 75. The 1960s were not a time period during which mental health especially that of teenagers, was taken seriously. Rebellious teenagers who acted out against the grain of what was socially acceptable were written off as troublemakers and emotionally neglected by the people who should have ensured their well-being. Though much has changed since then, there is still work to be done. Betty Williams was born in an era and a culture that could not possibly have appreciated her brilliance or respected her individuality. A teenage girl was struggling to find her place in the world, and she reached out for help in the only way she knew how, and everyone around her saw right through her. No one could see past their contempt for her idealistic spirit or overcome their fear of judgment from their peers long enough to just listen to that peculiar girl in their theater class. Shelton Williams, Betty's cousin, has said, quote, I don't believe that Betty ever wanted to die, end quote. Betty Williams was demonized when she should have been mourned, or better yet, saved. All sources for this episode are listed in the show notes. Please be sure to leave a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. If you'd like to request a case for me to cover, there's a link in the show notes for the case request form. You can follow the podcast on Twitter at CrimeAgainPod, on Instagram at CrimeAgainPodcast, and on TikTok at Crime Again Podcast. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll see you in the next episode of Crime and Crime Again.